Lord God's children because this is a day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, welcome to uh, In the Master's Hands with Elder Anyat Mashi. And as you know, El, uh, Pakistan has uh, power issues and Elder Anyat would be coming to you live today, but for one of those. So I'm Dr. Stephanie. I'll be teaching today until Elder Anyat is able to log in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving. Our love and devotion for you flows freely from our hearts and lips. We love you, Lord, magnify you and adore you, and we praise your precious holy name. We especially give you thanks and praise for your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. We thank and praise you that we believers dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We thank you that you've already heard our prayers, and we rejoice because your word tells us that all of your answers for the believers' prayers are yes and amen. We thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, understanding, and revelation knowledge, and we thank you for preparing hearts and minds to receive your word with full understanding and excitement. We praise you for the unending revelatory unfolding of your word and the people receiving it with expectation levels soaring to great heights. We give you thanks and praise as we come humbly before you with your or our request that you keep the nation of Pakistan and its dear people in the palm of your hand held close to your bosom. We thank you for the healing of differences between allied nations and especially the healing of Pakistani nation. We thank you that you are our provider <clears throat> and only source of supply and that your word promises us in Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 19, that you, our God, will supply and meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank you and we receive that supply in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we thank and praise you for meeting the needs of Elder Anyat Mashi, his ministry and family, and all of those that you take uh, care of through him. The necessities of food, clothing, education, educational materials, necessary for living an abundant life in Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. We lift up the children to you and thank you for taking care of their welfare and spiritual enlightenment. We pray and speak into their lives and overabundance of blessings on them for things that are necessary for daily living. I speak life, divine health, prosperity, and restoration into their lives and bodies. I thank you for an overwhelming hunger for your word and for each of them to desire to do your will. Lord, we thank you that your healing power is present to heal all who come to you in faith and in need. And we give you thanks and praise that Elder Mashi and your children are totally healed, made whole, and completely restored to your divine health. We give you all honor, glory, and praise as we walk by faith and not by sight in total expectation of your will being done here on earth as it is in heaven through us. In the name above all names, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, the great I am, we pray. Amen. Well, as I said, we have a, an issue with the power. So right now, we're just going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to give you the message today. You know, last week when we met, um, Elder, Elder Mashu couldn't be with us because of the power situation that you all face. So <clears throat> I taught on prayer. It's important because Elder Anya was talking before that about uh, prayer and fasting. So we're going to tie it all together. We'll keep it in that vein until he comes back and changes the subject according to the Holy Spirit and what he leads him to do. But today we're going to talk about the art of contemplation. Now confession is loud, but contemplation is silent. Contemplation is a lost art in modern day Christianity. The minds of many people have been so perverted and weakened by temptation that they can hardly concentrate for long or any thought, let alone on a, a holy thought. They can't pe spend any time on it. Their minds are fleeting this way and that way. There is no possibility of having a holy life until we have a holy thought life. Those who are mentally weak can develop mental strength by the exercise of contemplation. Romans 8 verse 6 tells us, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, the act of being spiritually minded, the minding of spiritual things, is the act of contemplation. Contemplation involves the concentration of our thoughts on the Word of God. The end result is the renewal of the mind. There are four steps in contemplation. The Old Testament saints who walked by faith exercised all these four steps. They received the promises by, number one, seeing them. Number two, being assured of them. 
three, embracing them, and four, confessing them. And we find that in Hebrews 11, 13. Now the first step involves visualizing, the second involves the assurance of faith, the third the outflow of emotions, and the fourth confessor, confession. And when we read God's Word, it, it has to not only be music to our ears, we must also allow the Holy Spirit to take the Word of God and create pictures in our imagination. There are two aspects of the mind. The two main Greek words translated mind are the words dialogismos and diania. Now, dialogismos refers to the intellect or reasoning part of our mind. It's the part that helps us to be logical and analytical. And this word has been translated as reasoning in various passages like Luke 9, verse 47, Acts 18, verses 4 and 19, and 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. <clears throat> the other word, diania, has been translated imagination and mind and is the more common word used in the New Testament in Luke chapter 1, verse 51, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, Hebrews 8, verse 10, and Hebrews 10, verse 16. This word has been used in relationship to the heart. Diania has a direct relationship with the imagination part of our mind. Now, Paul speaks of the eyes of, your, of our Diania in Ephesians 1, verse 18. The eyes of our understanding, Diania. In the Old Hebrew Testament, the word is yetzer, which carries the same meaning. It has been translated imagination several times. The Bible shows very clearly that God is concerned about our imagination. <clears throat> the renewal of the mind must include the renewal of the imagination. And the importance of visualizing is at stake here. Now, when, when Eve saw the fruit of the tree of knowledge, she desired to have it in Genesis 3, verse 6. When Lot saw the natural goodness of the land of the valley, he made the wrong choice in Genesis 13, verse 10. When Achan saw the Babylonian garment together with silver and gold, he coveted them and took them in Joshua 7, verse 21. When King David saw Bathsheba, he lusted for her and committed adultery, followed by murder, as we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. Wrong imaginations have caused the downfall of very, very many. On the positive side, when Abraham saw the dust by day and the stars by night as his descendants, faith began to arise in his heart to actualize the promises of God. Right, and here's our evidence. Genesis 13, verses 14 through 16. Genesis 15, verses 5 through 6. Two people can face the same set of circumstances, but if the imagination of each is different, they will have different results. The ten spies saw themselves as grasshoppers and ended up dying in the wilderness, whereas Joshua and Caleb saw that they were well able to overcome the giants, and they entered, the possessed, entered and possessed the promised land, as we see in Numbers 13, verses 28, 30, and 33. So the difference between successfully walking on water and drowning lies in the thoughts and the imaginations. Peter started walking on water based upon the spoken word of Jesus. But when he saw the waves, he was afraid and began to sink. Matthew 14, verses 28 through 30. So it wasn't what took place outwardly that uh, determined the miracle of walking on water. It was what took place inwardly, the thoughts and the imaginations. Now there's methods of contemplation. We're going to go into that. When we read the Bible, we should ask the Holy Spirit to help us pictureize the passages which we're reading. We should not only read the Bible, but we should read the Bible with our imagination. At first, we find it difficult to picture anything because our imagination needs training and development. However, gradually the mind will be strengthened and we will uh, visualize scriptures that are more difficult to picture, like the epistles, the letters. Through time, and training, our ability to mind spiritual things increases, and we begin to reap the benefits of a peaceful and a holy mind. We should take time every day to train our minds uh, in the contemplation of God's Word. Begin with just five minutes, then increase to 15 minutes, half an hour, and then one hour. Therefore, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of 
uh, a good report. If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate and think on these things. Philippians 4, verse 8. That's God's word on it. <clears throat> and we, we also need assurance in order to visualize these promises. We need the assurance of the promises. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the evidence and assurance we experience in our spirits when the promises of God are implanted into our spirits. Now, this assurance takes place only when the process of meditation and visualizing has impregnated our spirits. Without this process of planting the word into our spirits, we would merely have information and knowledge about the promises, which amounts to mental assent. Abraham received the promises of God regarding an heir when he was about 75 years old. But when God spoke to him about a child in his 99th year, Abraham laughed in unbelief. Genesis 12, verse 4, Genesis 15, verse 4, Genesis 17, verse 17. That's your evidence. Now, he believed that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in Genesis 15, verses 5 and 6. Now, at 99 years old, though, he thought that Ishmael would be the key to that fulfillment in Genesis 17, verse 18. Abraham had assurance for the promise concerning his descendants, but he had not yet received assurance for a son through Sarah. Now, in spite of his initial reaction of unbelief, because that's what it was, unbelief, Abraham became fully convinced, fully assured, fully persuaded, the Bible says, that God was able to perform what he had spoken. His assurance came despite the impossible circumstances that faced him in the deadness of Sarah's womb and in his own sterile body. Romans 4, verse 19. <clears throat> so it was in these seemingly hopeless circumstances, my friends, that God changed Abram and Sarai to their new names, Abraham and Sarah. From that moment onward, Abraham did not waver at the promise of God. He was strengthened in faith and gave glory to God, as we see in Romans 4, verse 20. You know, let me add to this, too, a little side note. Um, notice when God changed their names, Abraham's name was Abram and Sarai was Sarah. So he changed, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he changed their names to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham means father of many nations. Sarah means mother of many nations. So when they were calling to one another, as he would say, Sarah, he's saying, oh, mother of many nations. And Abraham, when she calls to him, is hearing, oh, father of many nations. So you see, God is very wise in what he does because he had them confessing. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. Had them confessing who they were and answering to that name because that helped to drive home subconsciously in our a subconscious mind that we are who our name says we are okay so from that moment on abraham did not waver at the promise of god he was strengthened in faith and gave glory to god as we see in romans 4 verse 20. <clears throat> excuse me i have a frog in my throat <laughs> since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god abraham was strengthened in faith by considering and meditating upon god's promise to him giving glory to god speaks of thanksgiving to god now we have to know that the things that meditation on the word will assure, right? So meditation upon God's word produces assurance. That's what we're looking at. Meditation equals assurance. We're going to be looking at how we can embrace the promises. Embracing the promises of God involves experiencing all the feelings involved in the fulfillment of the promises of God. To see implies distance. To be assured implies confidence. To embrace implies closeness. Faith does not follow feelings, but feelings are, are to follow faith. For example, if you are an athlete and you're lying sick in a hospital bed, visualizing the promises of God for healing will allow you to see yourself running again. You are confessing the healing scriptures to yourself. You see yourself in a race. The crowds are cheering. You are in full health, running steadily to the lead. The joy of the victory fills you. Your family and the press congratulate you. The joy of what you visualize so captivates you that you forget that you are still in a hospital bed. You start rejoicing in what you visualize, and then suddenly you realize that you're still in bed. By then, the assurance of healing and health has been built up even stronger into your spirit. 
In the first step of seeing the promise, you hold the vision, but now in the third step of contemplation, the vision holds you. It moves you. It motivates you. It touches you. The reality of the vision far surpasses the reality of the things around you. This is what is meant by embracing the promises. So you experience the vision emotionally. This is an, uh, a wonderful thing that God does for us. So we now begin our confession part, confessing the promises. By the time your visualization and contemplation has reached step three, embracing the promises, the fourth step of confession is a piece of cake. It's easy. Many people find this fourth step difficult because they have not gone through the first three steps. Confessing the promises involves calling those things which be not as though they were and believing it. When we have spoken to the mountain to be removed, we are to believe that we have received. Mark 11, 23 and 24 tells us that. Abraham called himself a father of many nations before he and Sarah received Isaac. He believed God rather than circumstances. So it's important, um, it's important to differentiate confession of things to come as though they were and denying the existence of things as they are. This is the hard part, folks. This is where we all get hung up. Uh, it's, it's better that you spiritually visualize this because then you can contemplate it rather than uh, just try to envision it on your own. It's very difficult because we get our focus shifted off of the things that we are supposed to be focusing on and we get carried away with what's going on in the world. And that's the enemy's tactic. So Abraham was not denying the existence of the impossibility in his circumstances, having a child from his own loins, but he was denying the right of those circumstances to continue to exist. Faith confession, however, understands that natural circumstances are real, but it can be changed and molded by believing in confession. All right. I'm going to say that again because I think you need to hear it. Okay. Um, it's not denying the existence of the impossibility in the circumstances, but it, it's denying the right of those circumstances to exist continually. All right. Faith confession understands that natural circumstances are real. They are, but it can be changed and it can be molded by believing and in, by using confession. Now, this principle didn't start with the faith movement, but it started in Jesus' ministry. Jesus showed the power of words over circumstances and exhorted his disciples over and over again to believe and exercise the same dominion. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Mark 11, verse 23. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will, be, will, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Matthew 17, verse 20. If you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. Matthew 21, verse 21. You see, Jesus leaves absolutely no room to doubt that if we have faith, our words will carry the power to change our circumstances. We can have what we confess, folks. Now, I hope that you uh, received this today. If you have any questions, you can contact me. Uh, I'm available by email uh, at uh, masterstouchhs at gmail.com. That's Masters Touch HS at gmail.com. I'm actually going to give you that by spelling it. <laughs> okay. And that is M A S T E R S T O U C H H S at gmail.com. You know, um, I want to invite you uh, to join us on well, I don't know that the time would work for you, but join us on, you can actually join us online in the archives uh, for um, how to study the Bible. 
That's every Tuesday night, every Tuesday evening, my time, which would be your time in the morning. <laughs> uh, my time at 7 p.m., your time 7 a.m. Uh, on Tuesdays, on uh, uh, Spreaker.com. I'm sorry, just a second. I have to do something here. Okay, here we go. Um, and that's on Tuesday mor Tuesday mornings, your time, Pakistani time, for how to study the Bible. I'm going to teach you, and I am teaching the people that come to that program, how to study the Bible, how to understand the Word, and how to get the most out of it so that you gain understanding of it and can apply it to your life successfully. Now, um, let me remind you that you can hear Elder Anyat Mashi streaming live directly from Pakistan every mon Monday right here at 8 a.m. Pacific time, which is my time, and which is 8 p.m. in your Pakistani time zone right here on Spreaker.com. Now, we archive all of Brother Ainyat's broadcasts on our website, themasterstouchhs.org. That's themasterstouchhs.org. You'll find them under In the Master's Hands on the navigation bar and also on YouTube.com and Facebook. Tune in every Monday for an anointed message from Elder Ainyat Mashi. Everyone is welcome to join us, and uh, we'd love to have you come and join us for our program. <laughs> Remember, Proverbs 4, verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all of your getting, get understanding. That's exactly what we're doing here, my friends, seeking for and gaining God's wisdom. So be sure to keep Jesus Lord of your life. My friends, please continue to pray for Brother Anyat, his family, their ministries, and for the nation of Pakistan and its people. In the Master's Hands is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International, a 501c3 organization. God bless you.